broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. Welcome back for another episode of the Freight 360 Podcast. And if you are brand new here, make sure to check out all the other episodes and all of our content. If you go to Freight360.net, make sure to hit the subscribe button, whether you're watching on YouTube or through the podcast channels. Leave a comment, share us with your friends. And if you'd like to learn more about Freight360 and our training, make sure to check out the Freight Broker Basics course. It's a full-length course that walks you through everything from how to start your brokerage, get customers, build a carrier network, and even hire the right employees. And this episode is brought to you by Blue Book Services. Blue Book is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce. Their online database contains thousands of companies throughout the produce industry supply chain. You can easily search their database to generate new sales leads. Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help resolve disputed loads. To learn more, go to ProduceBlueBook.com and click join today. That's ProduceBlueBook.com. All right, Ben, what's happening, man? How are you today? I am doing well. We're on our way into fall, enjoying the nice little shift in weather, and uh, things are starting to pick up in the industry. So all's good in my world. You? It's Yeah, it's uh, it's in the 50s right now here in Buffalo. I actually was wearing a hoodie, and I took it off before we recorded because it's a Bills hoodie, and I felt... Uh, I felt this week was maybe not the best week to to wear anything Bills, considering they got embarrassed on uh, Monday night. But um, speaking of sports, week one of the NFL was just an absolute Shit wild show. one. I mean, the top three AFC teams all took a loss. Um, your Chiefs, uh, the Buffalo Bills, obviously, and the Cincinnati Bengals. So that's... Um, I saw a stat that made Rough. me laugh. It was it was a meme this morning. It just it was a picture of your QB, and it said he had more completions to the Jets than Aaron Rodgers does so far this season. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the big news. Aaron Rodgers yeah. is out for the season now with the Achilles injury. I mean, I saw some funny like some funny memes that said like Aaron Rodgers um, highlight reel with the New York Jets, and one of them just showed him holding up the Jets jersey when he signed. And another one showed him running out on the field with the American flag before the game started. It was like, that's his highlight reel. But so, I mean, that's big news, right? Four snaps in, he's out for the season. Um, so that's, you know, it's you hate to see that. But somehow the Bills are up 13-3 and still can't win that game. Um, Josh Allen threw like three interceptions, had a fumble turnover. He he single handedly lost that game. It was a it was a rough one, and I uh, hope I hope that's a wake up call for for Josh Allen. Well, I will tell you this: I don't think the Steelers had a first down in at least the first quarter, maybe all the way through the second. And I think there was someone from the Forty um, Niners O line was quoted. They were talking about the radio this morning. He had said. To be honest, I was really kind of hoping they would convert one of these. I was getting pretty tired. We were on the field for like a quarter and a half, basically, because <laughs> it was three and out every single time the Steelers yeah. offense got on the line. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Did you see the uh, Dallas game? Like 40 to nothing or whatever it was? Uh, that I game was just absolutely that. insane over the Giants. Man, Sunday night football. That was a good one. So, any, I mean, Cowboys like America's football team, right? So, anyone out there who's a Dallas Cowboys fan, congratulations on a uh, absolute landslide win there. But hey, week two is going to be a new, uh, it's a new game, new week, uh, new mentality. So, well, speaking of which, you want to shout out about what we're, we're going to be doing yes. poll wise. So, we are going to be um, doing a basically a, a pick 'em league. Free to join, um, no purchase necessary, but there's going to be a prize at the end. So look for details in the coming week or so. We're going to have it in, it's going. It's already being shared on social media. Make sure to hit subscribe to the newsletter and we'll send out the links and the newsletter um, to make sure that everyone's got access to it. We're, it's probably going to start for week three because this is, I mean, we're already, already heading into week two right now. Um, but stay tuned. The way it'll work is you're going to have to pick you know, who's going to cover the spread for each game throughout the week. And you get points assigned if you get it right. And at the end of the season, whoever, basically whoever has the most points 
will win a gift card from us. No purchase necessary. So make sure to join that once the uh, details come out. Super excited for it. It'll keep us all engaged as a community. You know, something fun Agreed. to do. Looking forward to it. Yeah. We'll, we'll decide on what the amount is, but it's got to be something at least worth it so that you can look forward to it. So Yeah, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, something like that. Well, it'll be worth your time, right? I mean, you're... That way you can win back some of the money you're losing on your other pools or your uh, DraftKings or whatever. Um, speaking of which, did you see DraftKings got they got some flack, man, for their uh, their nine eleven parlay? No, what, what, why did they have? So a- they offered they had to take it down. It was called like a never forget nine eleven parlay, and it basically had the Jets, the Yankees, and the Mets to all win uh-huh. on nine eleven. And like they got a ton of flack for basically trying to monetize nine yes. yes. right. eleven. Um, they're not the first company that's gotten flack for doing stuff like that. It's happened in the past in previous years with other companies. They don't mean anything, you know, bad by it, but you know, it's it's not a not, not a, a good, good look. look. Not a good move. There's other ways to make money. <laughs> um, so it's switching over to news, and if you don't subscribe to the newsletter please do we do share uh industry news every single week our our newsletter comes out every tuesday and now we're adding a thursday edition that'll come out that'll share with you some market and industry updates as well as additional news um so some of the big stuff in trucking that i saw is california basically said driverless trucks eh -eh, we're not gonna allow it to happen um California is like the worst sometimes when it comes to regulation, I swear. But they they basically put the kibosh on it. Obviously, self-driving cars have become a thing, right, with Tesla. And Elon Musk has taken Tesla into the, the Class 8 truck market. Um, so you would obviously assume driverless semi-trucks would be a thing. But California already said, no, we're not going to allow that to happen. There's a lot in the news related to their driverless cars. And again, I don't want to go super off topic, but anyone who wants to just Google around to see some articles in the news over the past couple of months, because they have a lot more of the driverless taxis, at least around San Francisco. There was one article over the summer that like pulled people for how many people were, it was having intercourse in a driverless taxi. And it was like a pretty high number. And they were just talking about like the crazy things that are happening because some people aren't happy with it. And then the New York Times did a piece where they literally went and rode one around and then met with the CEO because I think, I can't remember off the top of my head, I don't want to misspeak, but the major company that is doing it, they interviewed. And it was a really interesting interview because they're becoming more prevalent But again, like anecdotally, there were lots of stories that just didn't make me feel comfortable with it, right? Of people like kind of walking in front of them, them like not really understanding. And it didn't give me a warm and fuzzy feeling about just hopping in a car without a driver in there. We'll just leave it at that. So I can see why some of the sediment there is maybe different. But Gaddick was in the news because I think it was another driverless truck company that's actively running lanes now. In fact, I reached out to them for comment or to see if we could connect with them but they were in the news for i cannot remember which company i will look it up right now i like how you said people having intercourse right like so you get a couple, to be of, PC. couple uh, <laughs> drunk college kids leaving the bar hopping in their driverless uber and just going for a quickie on the drive home huh <laughs> or after the bar on the way home. Uh, Tyson Foods, that's what it was. Tyson Foods and Gallic deploying autonomous trucks. So they're running okay. middle mile lanes, um, mostly in Arkansas. Is where, well, that's where Tyson is. So, But yeah, it was pretty big news on the driverless side for both of those. The other, other news in um, truck-related stuff right now is the de- decline in Class 8 truck sales. So obviously, if you remember, peak of COVID, pandemic, shutdown, you know, the bullwhip effect afterward, uh, everyone wanted to get in the industry. So class eight truck sales, they went through the roof and it was a very big backlog to get a new truck. They declined quite a bit. I know this was in our newsletter yesterday, but they're down um, over 9% year over year from, <clears throat> let's see, from July of 23 to 22. And the average sale price saw a decrease of 25% from the previous year. So that is obviously supply demand right there. There's, um, you know, people exiting the market as a trucking company selling their equipment. You're going to have prices driven down. So anyway, that is 
the news for you. Uh, Other, let's give uh, a, I got one you other got? thing too. I saw. I'm trying to get more details on this because I got a. It was from a Twitter or now X, but it shows a graph that it was like what's new in freight markets, and it shows truckload demand in the U.S. has risen for the past four months and turned positive year over year in July. The market still remains oversupplied, but for how long? It's got a pretty interesting graph. I could send you that maybe we could throw up on the YouTube channel, but you can see like, I mean, there's a peak in 2023 after it looks like around spring earlier this year, it falls down to the lowest low of 2022, but it's now back at honestly like mid levels for 2022. Um, supply is a little higher year over year too, but the demand is at least picking up, which again, ties in with the freight waves article we were talking about in the last episode about um, tender rejection rates going up over the past six months. Yeah. The first thing you see in the market, right, is the shippers will push rates down as far as they can in their bids, right? And again, like we've heard from brokers and things that they're seeing lanes, like target rates from shippers that are like, there's no way you're going to get a truck without a broker anyway. Like trucks wouldn't even run it for that. So we know yeah. they're somewhat overplaying their hand. They're trying to look good back to their budgeting offices that they're able to keep costs lower for the next 12 months. The reality is, is those are paper rates. And what's going to happen is the proverbial chicken comes home to roost as soon as they go to start moving freight down those lanes and the trucks and the brokers that both bid it and said, yeah, we'll participate in your bid. The reality is that no one's going to take the load. And then they're going to go from contract to spot. And as soon as that happens, that's what we need to bring the spot market back above contract is we really need the contract rate to first go down to an unsustainable level. And then the trucks leave and then they go and find work in the spot market. That's what is going to push rates up. So it's actually good news. Yeah, we'll see how it pans out, man. It's going to be an interesting next six months or so, but let's give a shout out to DAT and get into our episode today. Tired of struggling to find accurate rates and the right carriers for your freight? With DAT1, you can access more than 500 million posted loads and trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus, their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24-7. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the industry. You'll get real-time rates on every lane so you know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you commit to it. Plus, you get instant access to top bids from qualified carriers around the country. Take advantage of, well, well soon to be a discount for the entire year. Either way, you're going to save money. Use the link to subscribe to DAT1 in the show notes. Yep, it's a free month right now. It's going to become a full year discount soon to save even more money. But for now, it's still just a free month. All right, we're going to talk about a day in the life of a freight broker today. This is a, a highly, well, I mean, we looked at our, what kind of content are people searching online and looking up on YouTube. And our number two video is all about what it's like to be a freight broker, right? Obviously, we've done tons of content on prospecting and sales and lead generation and all of that. But we're going to talk about what it's actually like to do the job of working in freight brokerage from the beginning to the end of your day and how it's different based on maybe the model, the business model that you work in, right? Because some of you, maybe you're a W-2, and you work just a sales role, or maybe you're just an operations person. Maybe you're running your own brokerage, or you just launched a brokerage and you're trying, you're aspiring to to grow it. So you're going to be everything from janitor to CEO. Um, maybe you're an agent. Maybe you're a manager, right? So this can be very different. What we'll talk about though is kind of the general how the day starts, how it progresses, how it ends, and then maybe what happens in the after hours. And we can kind of talk about the nuances between those different business models. But um, let's start at the beginning, right? I want to I want to set the stage here because the time zone that you live in is going to dictate very heavily when, you're, when your day starts. Yes. Sorry, West Coasters, but you, the East Coast um, really determine. It's kind of the driving force in the U.S. economy, right? The stock market starts at 9 a.m., which means if you're a stockbroker out on the West Coast, that's 6 a.m. Is it 9.30? 9, 9.30, something like that? I Either way, it's like know. 6 or 6.30 it's, on the West Coast. Yeah. I, had a, I had a friend who... His uncle was a stockbroker in Southern California, and he was like out the door at 5, 530 every morning to go to the office because he's got to operate off East Coast. 930 time. to but, 4. So the, yes. the reality is we're not the stock market, but if your customer is on the East Coast, you've got to, you know, you've got to be able to function with their time. So 
you know, that's kind of the stage setter here. Um, so what I would say is the average brokerage office tends to have people staff before eight o'clock. What did you see? Did you guys have people in like seven, seven thirty when you were W2? I was, I was there at like seven every morning and we can, we'll talk about that. In did a you minute, have man- but I was, was there mandated hours though? Yeah. Mandated hours, I think were, I want to say eight to five with an hour lunch kind of is what I think they were. If I remember. Um, yeah, I really, I, I think was, it was eight, eight to five. five. Yeah. Eight, yeah to five eight to five with an hour lunch. And I would say this too, to that point, right is it also really does matter where your customers are, right? Or where you want them to be, right? Because again, I know freight brokers on the East Coast that started on the West Coast, all their customers are on the West Coast. So they are working until businesses usually close on the West Coast every day. So like they will start probably still around 8, 830 to get ahead of the markets on the truck side, but they are clearly working after five almost every day because that's when their customers are there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, so my phone will start ringing now, um, usually not before seven, but seven o'clock, anytime after that is like pretty much fair game when yep. there's an issue that's got to be handled. Um, so yes, you're going to start your day, you know, a little earlier than a banker would. We'll just kind of put it that way, right? You're not you're not a nine to nine to five or nine to four thirty bank hours. Um, seven thirty, eight o'clock, right? First thing you're probably going to do is put out fires if there's any fires, right? You're going to be going through your email, answering vo- or checking voicemails, whatever the case might be. Now, if you're a W two in an office, you might have an overnight staff that's handling certain things for you. And then it kind of alleviates that if you're an agent or if you're running your own brokerage, you probably either had text or calls coming in overnight or early morning, uh, or your inbox is going to be, uh, there, yep. but typically the big, the first, I mean, it depends on the day, 30 minutes or so. You're probably making sure that everything is kosher. No, like hot issues are going to be continuing on. Um, and then it's, updating kind of where you're at with all your existing loads that have been in transit. Um, Talk me through, or I guess take it away from there, Ben. What do you got? Yeah, it's a really good point. So like the thing I do want to talk about is what we were talking a little bit off air is like how you really start your day. And again, I'm not going to go too much into this, but your day doesn't really just start when you wake up. It really does kind of start when you decide to go to bed the day before, right? And I work on this a lot with clients, right? Where they're like, I can't get enough done. I don't have enough time in the day. But when you ask enough questions, you find out they're sitting there watching TV until two in the morning, still trying to wake up at six to be there at seven. Like you're not going to be running at optimal efficiency or effectiveness if you do not sleep well. There's tons of studies out there. Dean Croak went to Harvard to study sleep as it relates to truck drivers. They put a lot of content out related to it and some recently. But I do want to point out that by far, that is the biggest thing you can do to increase your performance in anything is sleep. There are some stats that show that like, if you like, again, a real quick rule of thumb is if you go to bed on Friday, count how many hours you slept on Saturday or Sunday, If you're sleeping eight hours and then sleeping four during the week, right? Like that's like a, almost like functioning on two or three drinks. Unless the you entire have kids day. and they become your alarm clock. <laughs> exactly. Right. So again, I, I want to point that out. The second thing is exercising every day is incredibly helpful for your energy and dealing and managing stress as like a proactive thing. So like, even when I work back at the big brokerages, like I would be at the gym at six in the morning till six 30, get a shower to be in the office at seven. Now I'll take you through the morning and why it was we noticed and my manager pointed this out to me actually was people that showed up at eight, they didn't really start their day at eight. They would come in no. at eight to be there by eight. And then they would get coffee and then talk to their Water buddy. cooler talk, a little bit of BS, look through the news, get up to speed. You're starting to walk around. There's a little bit of this. It's like 8 30, 8 45 before they're like really actually starting their day. And the comment he made to everybody, but I kind of took to heart because I just really wanted to succeed. And I'm looking for every advantage was he's like, think about when you, and I started looking like, when am I actually starting my day? And I'm like, he's right. And I'm like, well, if I want to start my day like that, with some time to myself, it can't be at eight. Like I got to be there at seven. I still do the same things, have a little bit of breakfast, maybe in the office, my coffee, read the news. 
But now it's 7.20 and I got 40 minutes plus the 40 minutes they're all waste every single day, right? That's five to six hours a week, right? That is just shy of a full work week you get back every single month just by making that little adjustment. But to get into your real question was like, what are the first things I did and had a team we're running, you know, 40, 50, sometimes over a couple hundred loads a week, depending on what was going on. The first thing I'm doing is finding out exactly what you said. What happened last night between when I went to bed, I always always have trucks over the road. Did the pickups happen? Did the guys get where they were supposed to? Were there any accidents? Were there any breakdowns? I need to be prepared before my customers arrive to be proactive on any issues that might have come up, right? If I got a truck that's supposed to deliver at 9 a.m., I do not want to find that out at 8.30 and my customer's in their office at 8 to tell them at 9 when they're expecting him. That is not service, right? Like that is acting after the fact and that is not the value you want to provide as a freight broker. So you want to know these problems or maybe problems to basically prevent them long before your customers are going to start talking to you in the morning. So it's find out, just like you said, what did or didn't happen last night, because when my morning starts, it's going to contact, I'm going to contact every one of my customers. How did everything go last night? Anything changed between yesterday and today? Any loads that came through or orders that you might need today or tomorrow that we didn't know when we talked at the end of the day yesterday? Because the industry is always moving, regardless of whether we're there. You want to constantly position yourself ahead of these things because that's going to save your energy and just being frantic, right? Like anybody that's running around trying to catch up is wasting way more energy than somebody that can methodically go through these things, right? So those are the big things I think first start to your day. Start it right, find out where your trucks were to make sure there weren't any incidents, and then immediately have this information to either get to your customer. So when they show up, you can say, hey, the truck you were expecting had an issue. I'm working on it now. I'll be back to you. That is a good, warm, fuzzy feeling for your customer. Yeah. Even when there's an issue, they know you have found it before they have it fighting them in their ass. So I want to add in here too. one of the any way that you can use a tool or a procedure to make your job more efficient is going to be a positive. So GPS tracking or some sort of um, way to eliminate the manual check call is a very, very good opportunity. Like we, we, we try to put GPS on every single load for this reason, right? If I log in in the morning and I take a look at the board and all the loads, if I can just see, oh, here's where they've moved throughout the night. If they were driving overnight, which a lot of trucks do, yep. all good, right? I don't have to call a driver when they're presumably possibly asleep right now and yep. have to make sure that you know they are where they're supposed to be. So GPS tracking can help you a lot with that. Having those emails automated and sent out to your customer at regular intervals, if they prefer that, that's a great option as well. Um, but I like what you said, having that the call with your your customer, figuring out not just what's going on now, but what else is on the docket for the day. So, um, the more what would you say? Would you say you kind of? Uh, I would say AM and PM in brokerage kind of, it's almost like there's two, there's kind of two sets of things, right? The morning is like, all right, here's my existing stuff and what I have to figure out for the day. And you're going to revisit that in the afternoon too, right? Was there any fall yes. off for you? We're going to, but we'll come back to that in a second here. So, all right, um, we get to the morning, all of our trucks are all set. Customer says, all right, here's my loads for this or for today that I'm trying to get covered. Take me through that. What are we doing? Okay. So the first thing, right, to your point is there go, there are waves of deliveries that kind of happen in groups. Now, this isn't always the case, but like you'll typically see trucks that deliver first thing in the morning, right? Because they want to, to start their day to run other loads that day. So you usually see lots of trucks deliver in the morning and then go to the load boards earlier morning to, got, to get reloads. You see that same wave happen again in the afternoon for the trucks that got unloaded later in the morning and need reloads in the afternoon. So you see like two basic waves of truck availability and where they get booked. It's usually kind of like early morning and then early afternoon, right? And it's a little different depending on which market you're looking at. So again, to that point, I've already got updates on all my trucks, whether it's through GPS or actual phone calls or emails. I got my, my arms around that. I'm talking to my customers. They have now told me what has changed, what's going out today, what is maybe urgent or priorities that happened overnight, neither of us were aware of, right? So the next thing I'm doing, now that I've confirmed the loads, is these got to get posted up to the market as fast as possible. I want my loads to be offered to those guys just getting empty as soon as possible because there's an advantage there. If those drivers can get those loads sooner, 
then they have an advantage to keep their wheels rolling. So again, the guys that are waiting longer for the better paying loads, that's not going to help you much. But there's a big group of the carriers that will prioritize moving over making an extra hundred bucks on a load. Like it's better for me to just grab the load, keep moving because that's when I'm making money. So again, after you're doing this, you want to get all of your loads posted up or you want to be reaching out to your own carriers that have run these lanes for you in the past and go, here's what I got for today. Any of these work for you? Yeah, I want to hop in there because... Um ideally, if you have a, a a network of preferred carriers or trusted partner carriers, that should be your go-to number one, right? Yes. I always say post a load as a last resort. If you're brand new, that's your only, it's your, really your only option, right? Other than trying to proactively call carriers that you, that you know nothing about. Um, so yes, um, post, but also reach out to your preferred carriers, right? Who's run that lane in the past? Who has capacity in that area? Um, that should be your ideal number one. The majority of capacity in the market does not exist posted on the load boards as an available truck. It's either a, it could be a carrier that's logged into DAT or truck stop and is kind of snooping around and trying to see what loads are posted. Um, or it could just be a carrier that they've got their good list of brokers, right? Yes. And they talk to them every day and that's where their trucks go. Two strategies to execute that to your earlier point. One is every carrier that works with me on a consistent basis sends me, because I ask them to, daily emails on where they might need loads that I'm not aware of. A truck that ended up somewhere, a truck that took another load they weren't expecting and needs a backhaul or needs to get somewhere, right? So what I should have on my desk every morning is also all of the available trucks in different areas from my carriers. So now when I'm talking to my customer, I can see this as I'm talking to them. And if they go, I need a load out of Memphis and one of my carriers had a truck they sent me, I don't even need to call them. I already have it on my desk. And the second thing I do is once I get these loads, you're right, rather than me posting them up first, what I'm really doing is emailing those to all my partner carriers first, whether it's through a system like in DAT or whether it's through highway or whatever system you're using to manage your carrier base. I am letting them get first choice at all of the loads because I want them to be able to look at them as they're planning their mornings and things changed for them. And then they're going to start responding with emails. Those are the people I'm going to talk to first to try to get my loads covered with, to your point, my most reliable, trusted through experience carriers that I've worked with. Right. So again, that's your morning. You really want to get that up. So, I mean, to be honest, like depending on how many loads you move, this could take all morning. This could take you until 10 o'clock. It could take you until yeah. 9 30, 10 o'clock. Like it, some days it might only take you until 8 30 if you're starting at 7 30 or 7 in the morning. It depends where you are in your journey, right? Because yeah. really your next activity is going to be your prospecting. And if yep. you don't have a lot of customers or any customers, guess what? Your prospecting starts when, when the day starts. You're not you're not dealing with fires being put out. So again, this all depends on uh where you're at in your journey, what you're job situation looks like if do you own your own company is it just you are you an agent are you a w2 it's just going to be very different for each individual um so yes you've got your loads um offered out there via load postings um to carriers that you have you've done business with in the past you're going to get them all covered rate confirmation sent out confirm with your customer who it is that's picking them up when all those details and you could take a big exhale all right, I'm caught up. And then my next step is going to be prospecting. Well, now, yes and no. Let me ask you this. Well, oh, yes and no, because I want to point out ahead. one thing, right? You've booked these carriers, but a lot of them will still be on their previous loads, might not be empty yet. And you still got to keep an eye on how and when and are they still tracking to make the appointment they expected, right? Because you yes. want to talk to somebody at 730 that's got a 10 o'clock pickup and it might be a tight window where it's by appointment. And they were fine at seven, but a traffic jam, a car accident, something could happen before they arrive there. So even though you're switching from this topic, or we'll call it task, you want to keep kind of an eye on the loads that are still supposed to load that morning and just keep looking at the GPS maybe every half an hour, or you know maybe you shoot another email out an hour before the pickup and just say, hey, I know we talked two hours ago, is the truck still on? track to make the pickup at 10 a.m. Because again, you're trying to be proactive, not reactive. The most likely thing to come as a curveball in your morning is the truck you booked that morning or yesterday to pick up today. 
that thought they were going to arrive and whatever happens on the road, blown tire, a hundred different things we could say. So, Or they found a higher paying load and they just screw you. Exactly. And that happens good, as well. It's a good point though. Um, until that load is picked up, you are on, you're kind of in the hot seat. You got to make sure that everything goes as planned because you may have a customer that you've decided not to give the pickup number to the driver until they are like five minutes out, right? Or the actual full address until they're, you know, 30 Within. minutes out or whatever the case yep. might be. So yes, you're going to have um, preset or predetermined commitments like um, confirming pickup, pickup numbers, all that stuff with carriers to get those loads covered. So that's a good caveat. One last point. One last point, and then we'll go into prospecting, is if you have a team and you have a track and trace team, you don't want them just doing this in the morning, right? You want them also, again, to do exactly what we said. It doesn't need to be you, but you want them to make sure they're still tracking and paying attention to these, even though they check them in the morning to make sure they're still on their way. Because this is the biggest thing that will disrupt the whole rest of your day. If that truck breaks down, you don't find out until your customer does. When that customer calls you, everything you plan from that point forward now is different because that's what you've got to fix. So whatever you can, whether it's yourself or someone else, like, again, really want to drive that point home. Yep. Now, uh, next big activity is going to be prospecting. And yep. we've beat a dead horse with all of our other content. We will continue to in our other content on the importance of prospecting. But I'm, I'm curious. I want to ask you, before you do prospecting, do you, do you press like pause in your day and do something to just kind of change up your mindset, like go for a walk or maybe you have a snack or you eat lunch. Do you do something like that before you get into prospecting? I do. In fact, I, it is a very different mindset and I need a higher energy. I need the energy level that I bring to this, which is completely different to doing task work, right? For me, it's music. Um, and like I will transition through tracks or I keep like a liked playlist of songs that like I'll listen to either only in the gym and only before I'm going to prospect because I don't want to like play them out. So like there are a few that I'll like cycle through that I'll listen to that I put on in my office. Everything's quiet and I just get into kind of the mindset of like getting my energy up. I might do jumping jacks. I have buddies that used to do like push-ups. get the blood flowing, stand up, get that energy level because when you're going to make phone calls, that's a different energy level than lead research, which we can also yeah. talk about in a minute. So I absolutely do that every single time. Yep. Um, I've always been a gym late morning, middle of the day kind of guy to, to break up the morning activity from the afternoon activity. Um, it, it works for me. I used to be a morning guy and then I just, I, you know, I switched shortly after I got into brokerage to a middle of the day guy. I might switch. I've been contemplating that lately because I am a morning energy person and I go to the gym in the morning. But I think I'd be better off because I already have the energy in the morning. I think I might yeah. start going around lunchtime to actually make my afternoons a little more effective. But that's a really great tip. Yep. Um, so prospecting, right? You're going to probably have a couple hours of time blocked off because we've said it in our content. You're going to have a number of calls you're going to want to make. That might be 40. That might be 75. It could be 80. It just depends on where you're at and how much time you have in the day, uh, depending on the business that you already have going on. But this is when you're actually calling prospects, you are following up with prospects, uh, you may be sending email follow-ups to, to prospects or phone calls, whatever the case might be. Prospecting activity can be a number of things. What it is not is lead generation. That's a separate activity, which you, depending on your style, you might do that at the end of your day um, yes. for the next day, which is we'll talk about in a bit. But prospecting activity, uh, the way... It could be different for everybody. The way that I've always done prospecting in, in any job, even before brokerage was all at once, man. It was it was always in the afternoon too. But always I would just, you get into a mindset and I would just call, 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 yep. call. Just like that. Over and over. And I what think that's, that's really the most important piece, right? It's the rhythm and the momentum of doing it that really makes it easier and makes you better at it. And that's why, again, you separate these things. So to further make that point, right? Like what that means is you already have your leads in your CRM or in a list queued up, ready to go through with whatever points of that you need to review before you make that call all in one place. So you're literally only doing the dialing, making the phone calls and maybe kicking an email out. And again, 
even emails I kind of use with a different mindset and I'll usually group those together. So like I try, just like you said, to make all my calls all together where they're all in my CRM. Like these are the 20 calls I'm going to try to make this hour. I get 12. If I have a great one, maybe I only get two calls this hour. I could have a 30 minute conversation, right? Like that happens, but I'm setting that target and that goal, and I'm getting myself fired up to just run through it and to do it with the energy and the excitement that you really want with it, right? And I think that's one of the most important pieces. Yep. Um, I want to talk about lead gen. So again, your day could be fluid depending on how much operational stuff you have going on. So it could be interrupted at any point in time. But we'll say you've gotten through all of your prospecting calls that you had queued up for that day. Next up, you've got to prepare tomorrow's prospecting calls right? This is yep. where lead generation is going to be huge. Now, you don't. if your goal is to make 100 calls, you don't have to go find 100 more companies. You're going to have a set number of people already in your pipeline that are going to be a follow-up for the next day. So let's say you have, I don't know, 80 that are in your follow-up and you, you want another 20. Well, this is where your lead generation comes in, right? This is not prospecting. This is generating leads. You're doing your research and make sure to check out our content on how to generate leads. But there's a ton of resources, whether it's paid like Zoom Info or uh, other various uh, data companies, or it's LinkedIn, Google, Chamber of Commerce websites, Resource USA, or whatever it's called now. Well, and I want to point out, right, most people, a lot of the science around this shows that like the period of the day where you tend to be high energy, just like your nature the other path is usually when you're more analytical. So if you are typically a morning energy person, usually your afternoons are more analytical or vice versa. So for me, like I, stat, I, I got a stat on it. I, it's based on the, cir is it the circadian rhythm? Is that what it, it is? is? Yep. So this came from, I want to say it was, uh, is it Andrew Huberman, Dr. Huberman? Yep. Yes, it I is. I think it was one of his podcasts I saw recently. It's like 3 p.m. It's when the, yep. It's when the average human being, based on that rhythm, hits a slump. So every day, if when I have to, if I have to do like clerical work or things like that, I literally view this as like different versions of myself because it helps me like get into that mindset. Just like we were saying for prospecting, that's high energy. Like I feel like I'm going to play a sport. Like I had a boss that used to use this analogy. Like when he would put his suit on and his cufflinks, he's like, this is me like in the locker room getting ready to go do this. And I get in that mindset and that's it. And to this day, he's still the most lethal person I've ever met in sales. But to the other point, right? I know the other side of me is likely to be better detail oriented. So like I play into my tendencies. So that's when I do my emails or my lead generation because I know the energy is not there. I can force it and I can do it when I need to. If a call comes in or somebody has availability that I've wanted to speak to, right? That's an out of the ordinary scenario. But if it's a day where I'm choosing what I'm doing, I'm doing the lead generation exactly when you said, like somewhere between usually three and four or four and five. And then it's exactly that. It's a different job. You're putting a different hat on. You're going to use a different skill set. That's more research. That's, you know, digging into companies, looking for news articles, trying to find trends or things that are happening in the industry to put one and one and sometimes one together to find out who do I really want to go hunting after this week? What season am I in? What is a good, likely or high probability that I'll get someone on the phone that might need what I have, right? Yep. Um, so there's, there's more to go in your day here, but first a shout out to our friends at lean is your freight brokerage hiring. You've got to check out lean solutions group, the industry leader in nearshore staffing for logistics companies with offices in South America, Mexico, and the Philippines. They offer a wide range of roles from back office operations to web development and marketing partner with the best visit www.leangroup.com to learn more. That's L E A N group.com. All right. So we've gotten through putting out fires in the morning where we've covered all of our loads for the day. We've made prospecting calls and we have our lead gen done for tomorrow's calls. How do we wrap up our day? Because we're going to, there's going to be that afternoon time where it's crucial to get on the phone with your customers and not only find out what's coming up for tomorrow, but what may have fallen off today that they need covered before the end of the day. Right. Yep. So I think this is always a great time. These and this can be a lot of this can be done throughout the day via email too. So whether it's email or phone call, whatever the case might be, having some kind of communication with your customers in the afternoon is 
crucial. And I, I already named a couple of these things, but number one, did any anything go wrong today that needs assistance, whether it's on a load that I'm taking care of or maybe somebody else fell off yep. of or tossed back to them? Also, what do they have coming up for tomorrow that I might be aware of and get a head start on? And let's set expectations on, hey, if something happens after, we'll just say 5 p.m. to give it a, a, a time, make sure they know how to get a hold of you or what's the expectation if there's an issue in the in the after hours do you have a phone number, or a cell phone for them, or whatever the case might be? But this this afternoon contact is crucial, in my opinion. It is, and I think one really important thing to point out is you should not just be deciding what this is and then applying it to all of your customers as if they're all the same. They are not, and what I mean by that is during your onboarding process and even frequently after that, you want to ask your customers what type of communication they prefer. Do they prefer email? Do they prefer phone calls? What makes their job easier? At the end of the day, I view my job as support to my customers, as if they are literally work colleagues that I work for, that I've got to check in. And if it was just like that, I would do it the same way I do with my manager. What do you need from me this morning? What is the best way to communicate? Do you need me to stop by, shoot you an email, wait for you to let me know? I want to be able to be proactive. If you've got things coming up, let me know the best way to, for us to communicate. Some will tell you email, some will like conversations, some like to talk. I've got certain customers within the same company that are all different, right? Some love to be on the phone, some only want emails. And again, you want to know this before you just start applying whatever you assume they want is I think a really important point. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, hit on something else while we're on this topic of like setting the expectation for communication. That goes internally for your team too. So like okay, if you are a one man show, you're 20, you're basically 24 seven on call. You better have that cell phone right near you when you're sleeping too. But let's say you work at a company that has an after hours team. It doesn't matter if you've got thousands of brokers or employees, or if you've got 10, someone's probably covering after hours or is on call for that, right? If it's, if you have that person to rely on, once you kind of shut off or shut down for the day, have that like list of, Hey, if it's after hours, call me if X, Y, or Z happens. And also, hey, if yes. this happens, wake me up, right? Like depending on how serious it is, you Huge. kind of have that list of here's the criteria. If if this, then call me. Oh if my this, gosh. You know, right? Enormous. I can tell you I've worked at a big company and before I got good at that, I would get phone calls all night, all the time about every single thing that happened even uncovered loads, I would get phone calls about at two, three in the morning because like the, the things weren't set right or I didn't clearly communicate what I needed to be aware of. And this goes again, whether you're in a small company or a large company, even if you're by yourself, you want to do these things with your carriers that you work a lot with. Like yeah. my carriers that I've worked with for my entire career, they know what I need to be woken up for. They know what I want to find out about at two in the morning when it happens. And they know what I can find out and care about at six in the morning. And we will literally communicate differently because we have set these things up, which is a huge peace of mind for you as a broker, because depending on what you're moving, like there were periods and seasons when I've done this where like every night I'd be woken up at two, three in the morning, like for like months at a time, because we had a lot of stuff moving overnight. You want to be able to, again, like you pointed out, get ahead of these with processes whenever possible. So that's a huge yep. one. Yeah. Weekends, after hours, all that. Have the expectation. That is huge. Um, I'm like, hey, and if you're a, if you're a manager, right? Because we did say we talk about that. If you're a manager or you're in some kind of leadership role and you're not in the trenches every day, have that expectation set for your brokers in your yes. company as well, right? I get the whole... Hey, I'm here for you. You know, just call me if anything goes wrong. But realistically, we all have a life, and there's a reason that you know there's people have certain positions and, and roles within the company. Don't have them call you for every little thing that happens, right? Correct. Um, there should be some sort of chain of command, too, right? Like it shouldn't have to go all the way to the top and let every alert the entire company because someone you know blew a tire and it's going to be you know late to their pickup or delivery, right? Try to handle it at the lowest level. Um, Tim set those expectations, they'll save you lots of headaches. Tim Ferriss has a premise. It's in the, his first book, The 4-Hour Workweek. And he's like, think of it like this. What is the one decision you can make that would save you from making a thousand more decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And the example he used was like, he, he ran like a, um, 
uh, or like a, a supplement company in the, originally in his career. And he said, I would get called and need to approve every change to an order of any dollar amount. So I'm doing this sometimes dozens of times a day for like 12 and $13 or $20. And he's like, when I decided that I gave my team the approval that it doesn't need to be anything less than $250, don't call me. He's like, they were smart enough to make these decisions anyway, to your point, right? Not everything needs to go all the way to the top to be decided. So again, in freight brokerage, it's usually by the task, maybe, maybe not the dollar amount, but even so dollar amounts on loads, right? You want to be able to give your carrier team, if you have one, the authority to go $25 over your max, if the situation calls for it, you don't need to be involved in every one of those. Cause if you are, you're going to run out of yourself real fast before you ever get to your financial goals. Yep. So, um, let's recap your day, right? We went yep. through step by step by step. You're starting off your morning. Um, well, even before you start your morning, you're starting off the night before. Yep. Get a good night's sleep, right? Get that. I don't care if you need six and a half hours or nine hours, whatever your body needs and you know what your body Give needs, it it. get it. Okay. Yep. If you don't just understand that you you shot yourself in the foot before you even started working. So you got a good uh, night's sleep. You have your morning routine. You're taking care of yesterday's or overnight's issues, putting out fires. We're covering loads for the day. Um, we're prospecting. We're doing some lead gen for tomorrow's prospecting. We're talking to our customers in some way, shape, or form to set expectations and maybe handle any last minute things and rinse and repeat. Yep. I think one of the things that we left out that is really noteworthy and that I've noticed a lot through the pandemic, like I started my career in sales, you know, well, 20 some years ago now, and it's all in the office, right? So you're in settings where you are literally immersed in people doing the same thing. There's an energy level there, right? There's an excitement. Even when you get off your prospecting calls, good and bad, there is value in being able to share the wins and to talk about some of the losses, right? Like the conversations or the accounts that didn't go the way you thought, right? There, We're human being and we need other people to talk through these things to be able to express stress or to retain energy, right? So when we shifted right to work from home, this was very noticeable to me that this was absent. And it's, it's a different lift to get yourself into that energy level when you're literally by yourself than when you are amongst other people doing this. And some of the things that I found that are in between solutions, right? Like it doesn't need to be a mentor, but if you can find a friend or even anybody else in your company that you can prospect with or connect with throughout the day. And again, the way I do it is like, sometimes I'll just open a Zoom for two hours where we're literally both prospecting. They're prospecting, I am, and the sound isn't even really on. Like we can mute it and not mute it, but the fact that there's somebody doing that with you really does make that easier. I find it easier to have that energy level. And to me, when I don't have somebody to bounce ideas off of, because I'm extrovert, so I get my energy talking and relating with other people, right? So for me, how I also get that momentum, as I was thinking about it too, like is music, but it's my other partners in the businesses. I talk to them every day, like, what are you seeing that's hot in the market? What are you excited about? This is what I'm excited about. And we get energy from each other. I carry that momentum in through the day. So again, if you are out there and you are by yourself, this is one of the reasons why we created Freight 360 this way is so that you have an outlet to be able to understand what others are doing, what's going on, and to be able to connect with other people, right? So yep. whether it's our Facebook group, whether it's sending emails to other people in your company, whether it's to go on LinkedIn, whatever you can do, they don't even need to be in your industry. You could have sales guys that are in your buddies that are selling car insurance. It doesn't make a difference. Having somebody though that you can do this with, I think is also a really underrated aspect of just sales. And this is also one of the reasons why most of the companies are now saying they're gonna go full time, everyone's back into the office within the next year or so, or they're just gonna start letting people go because they see the difference in results, right? When people yeah. are together, they do better. When people are just sitting by themselves, it's much harder to carry that momentum when you're the only one carrying it. Agreed. Well, that's a good place to end on. Um, great episode. Let us know what you guys think. Do you want more content like this where we talk about, you know, the the actual doing of the job or you went more on prospecting, lead gen? Let us know. We'll continue to create new content each and every week for you guys. Um, anything you want to wrap up with or any final thoughts on your end, Ben? 
Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, for week two, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. If you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week.